Baltimore City, the Office of State's Attorney is particularly important. This year, three candidates are running for the top prosecutor job, and The Real News will be sitting down with all of them to talk about solutions to mass incarceration and violent crime. This is the second in a three-part interview with incumbent Marilyn Mosby. In the first part of our interview, we traced her first term through the tumultuous period leading from the death of Freddie Gray and the trials of the six officers charged in his death up to the recent federal police corruption trial of the Gun Trace Task Force. In this second segment of our conversation, Mosby lays out some of her visions for a second term. So with me today here for The Real News is um, the state's attorney, Marilyn Mosby. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you for having me. So the last time, we're in the middle now, it just kicked off really, the middle of the state's attorney's race. And the last time that you ran, you were running as the insurgent, as the challenger against Greg Bernstein. And now you are running on a record that you have had in this job. How is it different this time? How does, how does the campaign feel? I feel really good about, you know, the difference between then and now is that I'm running on my record. Um, so, you know, everybody knows that I'm fully vested in the city of Baltimore. I always say I don't have to turn on the news. I don't have to open up the newspaper to see the violence plaguing our community. I live in the heart of West Baltimore raising my two little girls. All I have to do is open up the door. Understanding and recognizing that my number one priority is always going to be and has been public safety. We prosecute between 45,000 50,000 cases a year in Baltimore City. We have a 93% felony conviction rate. My homicide prosecutors, which I tout as being the best, the brightest, most talented prosecutors in the country, you know, even despite the 20% increase in the number of homicides that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, have an almost 80% conviction rate. So you look at that traditional sort of role of a prosecutor being reactive. We have done our job. But I think for far too long, people in this position have not taken a holistic approach to prosecution. We live in one of the richest states in the entire country. However, Baltimore's population, 24% live in poverty and 35% of our babies live below poverty. We have to address those systemic issues as to why crimes take place. And so I've taken not just a reactive approach in prosecution, but a more holistic and, and proactive approach. So I'm ensuring that we're getting to young people before they get to the criminal justice system, giving individuals a second chance at triumph who deserve it. And you've talked about how mass incarceration doesn't really make us safer as a city. Um, and yet it's still something that is a major part of your job. How do you, how do you reconcile the two parts, the outreach part and then the, the... So I think I draw a very clear distinction and that's with, you know, adults or juveniles. If you hurt somebody, if you kill somebody, if you maim somebody, if you are um, taking someone's life, you have to be held accountable. And we're gonna do just that. You know, when you get a felony conviction and you make a short-sighted decision and you're thinking about instant gratification, you're not thinking long-term, which most young people do. They get a felony conviction and then what happens? They can no longer apply for a job. They can no longer apply for housing. They can't go back to school because they can't get any financial aid. And then what other recourse do they have but to go out doing what they were doing in the first place? That in and of itself presents a public safety concern and one in which I should be concerned with. That's the reason why we started Aim to Be More for first-time nonviolent felony drug offenders. They they go through a probationary period where they learn life skills and job training skills. They do community service and at the end of that probationary period they're given a job and their felony records are wiped clean. We implemented that in the height of the unrest. I've had some young people who have gone through that program who have gone from being homeless and, and, and facing 20 years incarceration to now being enrolled in community college and, and having a, a career, a construction job. You know, I, I think we're making a difference and we have to be able to address those systemic issues if we really want to see long long-term sustainable change in our city. It's been a, a very high profile and a very difficult uh, period of time in the city of Baltimore, um, especially in your position. Uh, so what do you, why do you want the job again um, instead of going and, and taking a nice high paying lawyer job somewhere and, and what do you want to do for the city the next time around? So I'm fully vested. Um, you know, this is my heart. This is my passion in reforming the criminal justice system. And I think that when you look at what we're currently faced with, we have a federal administration that is touting regression as making America great again. Um, you know, these uh, local positions are where the progressive change is going to take place. And we have so much more systemic sort of change. We have to build that bridge between the community 
and the criminal justice system that serves that community. Um, so, you know, I, whether it's additional um, partnerships, public-private partnerships, I think that that's incredibly important. When we look at the stakeholders within the, the criminal justice system, we traditionally only look to the police, the, the mayor, the state's attorney's office, and the judges in the community, of course. But there's so many other components to that, right? The business community has a role in changing, you know, what's happening in our community. Last year, we had an increase in youth violence. I charged more juveniles with attempted murder, twice as many juveniles with attempted murder and murder than almost the past two years combined. And, you know, we have to ensure that we're getting to our young people. And it's not just going to be the police, the state's attorney's office. It's also the business community. It's the faith community. Everybody has a stake in it. And so I'm looking forward to developing additional public-private partnerships that was exhibited through, um, you know, the pop-up events that we had where we looked at the crime trends between the hours of six and nine on Friday nights. Every Friday night we had a pop-up event and it was something productive for our young people to do, whether it was laser tag and um, bowling or skating or experiences that they wouldn't otherwise have. We touched more than 2,437 children. We had more than 31 public-private partnerships. We just introduced uh, about two weeks ago Project 17, which is gonna focus on the 21217 area code where the uprising took place, which also happens to be my area code, um, where we're targeting truant, chronically truant young people, 11th and 12th graders, who essentially aren't going to school, but you know, who we wanna get back on the right direction, connect them to small businesses so that they have mentorship opportunities and understand the importance of entrepreneurship. Um, you know, so we have so much more work to do when it comes to victim witness services. This is the home of witness intimidation where the stop snitching mentality began. We were thankfully able to get $2.4 million federal grant, the largest grant we've ever gotten for, for victim witness services, um, but and doubled the size of the victim witness unit, but we have so much more to do, right? We relocated more than 125 families last year, and most of which were in homicide cases. The year before that, we, re we relocated 131 families. You know, I've gone down to Annapolis, I've spoken to the mayor, to the governor, you know, Senator Zirkin is introducing into his crime bill the more than $500,000 in relocation funds so that we can better protect those that we serve. We cannot do this job without the community and that, that's something that I'm gonna continue to fight for and fight with. The average Baltimorean who listens to all that and says, wow, but there were still 344 murders. I still don't feel safe when I walk out my door. Um, and I'm scared of both police and of, of criminals. How do, you, how do you address those concerns that, that someone may come to you with, or how will you address it in the, the coming in your next term? So terms? what I'm going to do is continue the community engagement of it, um, that portion of my office, you know, through crime control and prevention, the community engagement. We have community days in court where we open up the doors of the courthouse to the community. We talk about the intricacies of the criminal justice system and the importance of communities partaking, not just when they get on a jury, but understanding how the system works before they're on a jury. You know, we're going to continue to... Uh, issue the uh, annual reports that summarize the activities of the state's attorney's office. We're going to continue to, to, to push out, you know, the court watch program that allows them to, from their smartphone, follow cases within their community that are pertinent to them and their neighborhoods. Um, we're going to continue to ensure that when it comes to police involved deaths and shootings, you know, that level of transparency is the root of criminal justice reform. And we're going to be as transparent as possible. We are the only state's attorney's office that publishes our rationale for declining to criminally charge police officers in police involved deaths and shootings. We are the only state's attorney's office that has a conviction integrity, you know, division where we are exonerating people who are wrongly accused and convicted of crimes, you know, and so we have so much more work to do, but we have to be able to repair that trust.